More often than not, I've heard Zeppelin fans say they really liked Robert Plant's first three solo albums. To some, they were a continuation of textures from Intro the Outdoor, and to others, they were unique and magical creations from a cast of unforgettable collaborators. Where Robbie Blunt's slick guitars and the drummer trifecta of Powell, Collins and Hayward, plus the thick bass lines of Paul Martinez, get all the praise, there was a silent yet innovative contributor who shaped an important part of the sound of the 80s. From the carefully constructed landscapes of Big Log to the timeless optimism of In the Mood, he was the architect behind the playful maze of Little by Little, and many of Robert's finest achievements in finding his voice, far away from the band that couldn't be no more. His name is Gerald Jess Woodruff, and this is the story of the synthesizer cool behind Plant's early catalog, oh yes, and Black Sabbath. For British musicians near Birmingham in the 70s, the name Woodruff rang a bell. A drum kit, keyboard, or any kind of instrument. It was a music shop that catered to the dreams and desires of future rock stars, and many almost famous. The year was 1981, and Robert Plant kept his private life private, dealing with the grief of losing his friend, and therefore, the best band of the 70s. The pressure of thinking where to go next after everything crumbling to the ground was real. He faced the challenge of going his own way. Becoming a band leader was frightening, but this would be the final step for his musicianship to be complete. Robert decided to get himself a keyboard and went to the local shop, Woodroofs. Jess was the demonstrator who knew all the tricks. A sale was made. The Honey Drippers' first gig was scheduled for April. While they didn't use a keyboard player back then, things were set in motion for the nearby future. Both men shook hands and a partnership would begin around September. So what was Gerald Woodruff's resume by then? Well, let's go back to late 1975. Where Robert Plant and Led Zeppelin took a vacation after Elf's Court, Black Sabbath's tour began on July 14 in Ohio. Because Sabotage was one of the band's greatest ventures into progressive rock terrains, Jess Woodruff was brought as a fifth member for vital keyboard contributions on tracks like Megalomania, Cybracadabra, and Spiral Architect. Now, you won't find pictures of him on stage because he was working behind a curtain. Luckily, there's bootleg recordings as evidence. Jess was kept in close proximity to the Sabbath camp and recorded all keyboard parts for the band's next album, Technical Ecstasy. While not credited on this seventh studio album, Woodruff's wizardry can be heard throughout the record. I'm pretty sure the Eagles themselves witnessed his keyboard magic as they were using the next door space at Miami's Criteria Studios. Yes, this is the same place where some parts of Coverdale Page were recorded in 1993. Black Sabbath's Technical Ecstasy Tour the United States and Europe ran from October 22nd, 1976 until April 22nd, 1977, just when Led Zeppelin was three weeks into their last North American series. Woodruff's synth and keyboard work can be heard in Black Sabbath's Gypsy, All Moving Parts, and Dirty Women, plus Snowblind's closing section featuring a Mellotron. Past Black Sabbath's hectic schedule, Woodruff went back to doing his own thing. The year was 1980, and Led Zeppelin rehearsed in London for their upcoming tour of Europe. Jess Woodruff released his first solo album by the name of Opposite Directions. This is a fascinating listen in the style of Jean-Michel Jarre, Tony Banks, and other synthesizer giants of the time. The 11-track adventure features an insane list of keyboards that could easily be the whole inventory over at Woodruff's music shop in Birmingham. A Yamaha Acoustic Grand Piano, a Yamaha Electric Grand CP708, a Yamaha Piano CP30, 
a Yamaha CS30, a Yamaha CS10, one Yamaha Polyphonic Synthesizer CS50, one Yamaha String Synthesizer SS30, Krumer Performer Strings, one Fender Rhodes, a Polymog Synthesizer, a Minimog, a Clavinet D6, a Wurlitzer Piano, one of my favorite sounds ever, one Roland SH1, one Roland Jupiter 4, a Mellotron 400, and one Oberheim 2 voice synthesizer. The rest of the band on the album was comprised of Dave Anderson and Gibson John on bass, Eric Cairns on drums, and vocals by Jess Woodruff himself. I find it interesting there is no guitar player credit, as the recording has many electric guitar moments. Maybe they forgot, or maybe Jess was able to recreate these on his synthesizers. But of course, polyphonic technology was still limited at the time. Who knows? Now here's a quick overview of the album. There are six copies for sale on Discogs. If you can, get it. It's an unusual record for all synth pop and progressive rock lovers out there. I will put it on the same category as Tony Banks and Jumple Jones' solo work. Jess Woodruff had an exquisite follow-up album to his catalog, where he was commissioned to produce a 1981 keyboard odyssey by the name of Wonders of the Underwater World, a soundtrack from the film. Although I couldn't find useful information on the film itself, the music is a trip worth the time and money. I bought all four mp3 tracks for about 7 bucks at Trunk Records. You can find the link in the description below. If you like the music on Vangeli's 1972's The Apocalypse of Animals, you'll love this one. Growing up as a kid listening to my dad's collection of oxygen and magnetic fields, listening to this album was an experience to say the least. You can close your eyes and travel back in time. These are songs for meditation and contemplation of our fleeting and momentary existence. By September 1981, Jez Woodruff started working out songs with Rory Blunt, Paul Martinez and the rest of the band. Plan was lucky to have such a talented musician like Woodruff and his band. You can check out my post Led Zeppelin 1980s episodes for a deep dive of the tours, events and milestones of Robert Plant's early solo career. Now Robert's debut Pictures at 11 was released in 1982, featuring Jez Woodruff working with the songs as a great team player. It's funny how Jumple Jones' innovative contributions on Into the Outdoor were like a blueprint for Plant's choice of keyboard layers on his debut. 
Every song has a carefully placed woodruff sound that enhances these compositions into forever. Robert's follow-up cemented his place as one of the breakthrough artists from the 80s. Principle of Moments is filled with creative sound design and powerful hooks. All three hit singles were the result of discipline, effort, and great musicianship. Because of Jess Woodruff's parts comprised of up to 16 keyboard layers in some songs, Bob Mayo was brought in to assist with keyboard duties as well. One song, Through with the Two-Step, became a personal showcase for Jess Woodruff on Robert's tours of 1983, 1984, and 1985. Here's a life summary of his brilliant synthesizer extravaganza. Woodruff and his mates recorded one more album with Robert Plant. 1985's heavily controversial Shaken and Stirred was all about synthesizers. From a rolling synth guitar in the hands of Robert Blunt to Woodruff's expertise on sequencing, MIDI, and just about everything a keyboard could do. This album pushed the boundaries of what the band was capable of. The most 80s sounding record they ever did, it polarizes fans to this day, but the willingness to experiment cannot be overlooked. Tensions over the musical style of Shaken and Stirred led to Robert Plant disbanding the project in 1995 to start from scratch in 1987. Jess Woodruff went back to Black Sabbath, technically speaking, joining the Geezer Butler band for about five minutes. Jess is a legend that deserves higher praise for his tremendous contributions that remain exciting and impressive to this day. I say cheers to Jess Woodruff, the silent genius behind the keys. Thank you very much for watching. Bye bye.